Yeah, so I, I, I shall re reiterate this fact. This is, this is not a, a study in, 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 in mining in Antarctic. This is really a case study of, of kind of using these sort of slightly novel techniques um, in these sort of frontier terrains. And in this case, using this, this uh, idea of prospectivity mapping, um, which follows on really nicely from the, from the, uh, the last talk, um, sort of looking at how we could more, more efficiently do exploration in, in these areas that are, are hard to explore. So this talk is going to explain what prospectivity, prospectivity analysis is and how it can be used. Uh, how um, looking at regional scale mineral, mineral systems can be used for this kind of analysis. So again, it's thinking on a much bigger scale, these mineral systems, rather than this sort of deposit by deposit view. And, and using an example from the Antarctic Peninsula to highlight this technique in practice, uh, using a case study from, from this sort of modern, day, uh, modern day frontier terrain. Um, with the kind of data sets that you can expect to, to find in these sorts of areas and the kind of issues that you're very likely to encounter when, when dealing uh, with these types of examples and these, these, these sorts of data sets of these sort of very large areas. So as the way we measure the natural environment and collect geological information advances, the data sets that become available to us become more and more complex. So we've seen that with many talks today with examples of um, ROVs, um, autonomous vehicles, etc., etc. You know, we can easily build up these enormous geoscience data sets using these, these remote sensor technologies. Um, we can combine this with the use of, of big data to amass vast data sets of legacy exploration data and other relevant information. Um, and the ability to, of a geoscientist, for exploration geologist, to assimilate and digest all these different sources can become harder and harder. It's almost information overload. You know, we haven't got time to, to go through all these, these, these new vast data sets. So this is where prospectivity analysis comes in. This is essentially a tool set that, to allow the integration of multiple spatial data sets to quickly spot patterns in data that would otherwise be too complex or too time-consuming to do using traditional paper-based formats. So this, is, this isn't something that's going to tell you where um, mineralisation is definitely going to occur. It's not going to tell you where your next major global discovery is going to be. It, it's this tool to help focus uh, further exploration in areas that may be statistically more likely to, sort of, to host a deposit, host mineralisation. <clears throat> So this is, this is all done in, in GIS, uh, Geographic Information System. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure, sure all of you, most of you do. Uh, this, is, this is software that specifically is designed for viewing spatial data that allows very rapid viewing of a multitude of spatial data sets. Now, there's, there's two very basic forms of prospective analysis. Uh, the first is data-driven, and the second is knowledge-driven. Now, the former, data-driven, uses um, areas of no mines or mineralisation to calculate the probability of mineralisation in other unknown areas. So this is all used techniques such as weights of evidence or um, logistic regression, uh, and it requires a training data set of um, lots of prior knowledge of, of area studies, of, of mines, of known, known areas of mineralisation. So effectively, you need to know where mineralisation is, and you can use that to show where it may, both, may be statistically more likely that mineralisation may occur. Um, whereas knowledge-driven models relies on the user's knowledge of where deposits might occur and what um, a middle, middle deposit model in a certain area might be to apply value to probability of likelihood of mineralisation to different geological features. So this is what I'm going to be really talking on this talk, um, as it's much more relevant for unexplored areas where you don't really have this detailed knowledge um, of where mineralisation may be. So again, this is, this is in no way replacing the need for geological expertise or you know, getting your hands dirty, um, but it's just a, a way of analysing these patterns in, in a very, very quick manner, which would be sort of impossible to do in, in traditional paper-based techniques. So if we're using this knowledge-driven approach, there needs to be a good understanding of the geological processes that may have occurred that result in the type of mineralisation that you're interested in. Because what you're effectively doing is you're applying weights to different geological features that are all added together to kind of give you an idea of, of where mineralisation might be. But before you can apply these weights, um, 
it's imperative that you know, consideration is, is given to the genesis of, of mineral deposits. And normally when you go about your mineral reconnaissance work, um, you, know, you, you need a, a clear understanding of, of effectively what you're looking for. Um, and this will be your deposit model. And you know, this is a compilation information of, of mineral deposits, including descriptions of geology, uh, uh, genesis, geophysical information, uh, geochemical properties, classification. And we've seen lots of, sort of uh, examples of these sorts of block models already today. However, a good understanding of your deposit model can be a real issue when you're considering unexplored frontier terrains is you don't really have much logical information. You don't, much ha you don't have uh, a good understanding of lots of important logical factors, such as the tectonic history, um, the kind of overall structure. You may not even have a clear picture of the type of minerals that you might even be exploring for in, in kind of really extreme cases. So you've got a problem here in you know, this sort of traditional deposit model approach um, in these really, really sort of continental scale, unexplored environments. However, that may not necessarily be as big a problem as you might think. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on this, especially by the University of Western Australia, um, however, that shows that when considering exploration on a regional or continental scale, the fine details of the mineral deposit model is in fact irrelevant or um, you know, not particularly important. And you need to actually start thinking about this mineral systems approach instead. So this mineral systems approach, it considers sources, sort of pathways and traps as key mineral forming geological processes. And on the, the end of that axis, you've got your traps, which are effectively your, your different types of deposits. Um, but, you know, and you can see that they're, they're not really resolvable on scales that we're, we're looking at. Um, and also, they need to be located, you know, for a trap to accumulate, it needs to be located near a source and a pathway. So if they're not, they're not relevant. So we can actually almost ignore them or not consider them too much in these sorts of mineral systems um, approach. And comparison, um, when um, studies have been done sort of looking at uh, feeding in different types of deposit model into this sort of prospectivity analysis, and it's actually shown that it doesn't really, when you consider the fine detail of different deposit models, she doesn't actually have really any effect on your overall um, analysis. So this sort of regional scale prospectivity modelling may not actually be specific to a commodity or deposit type. Um, that's not the case when you're sort of comparing really different things like, you know, ura uranium host uh, sorry, sediment hosted uranium deposits, but, you know, um, orogenic gold has very similar results to um, uh, epithermal copper, for example. Uh, which is great news for um, using prospectivity analysis and unexplored terrains, as it means you don't need this detailed understanding of a deposit model um, when you're kind of using these really small-scale data sets. And um, this approach isn't really necessarily even commodity-specific, so you can do something quite general, and it will still give you, give you good answers. So the Antarctic Peninsula seems to be an excellent location to test this sort of regional scale analysis, as it's a really large area with sparse but, but varied data sets uh, covering the key um, themes that are required with regard to sort of mineral, mineral sources and pathways. So I'll give a quick introduction to uh, the geology of where, where we've been looking at. The peninsula is a, is a very mountainous continental margin, largely buried by an ice sheet, um, geologically, it's defined by Mesozoic continental margin magmatism and sedimentation, which is uh, against rifted Gondwan crust, um, which then, then the later subduction and associated magmatism, which ceased in the, in the uh, Cenozoic. No mineral occurrences are sparse, but there is low-grade copper and sulfur mineralisation that has been seen, largely associated with Mesozoic magmatism and uh, associated fluids. Now, this particular study uh, focused on a small area you can see there in blue on the Alaska coast, and we did that uh, due to the um, available data sets in the area. So, very quickly, I'll just, just run through the uh, sort of overall tectonic setting of this. Um, the metamorphic basement uh, rocks of the Antarctic Peninsula are limited, to their, it, it, limited in their exposed outcrop, but they date back to the Ordovician. Uh, with isotopic evidence for uh, older Proterozoic material at, at depth. 
Much of the basement on the continental margin of Gondwana, including the continental arc magmatism and the development of the thick Permian Triassic turbinite sequence in Northern, Northern Graham land, which is the uh, tip up the right um, on the top, top right there. This um, later on, you had the break of Gondwana in the region during the uh, during the early early Jurassic, which uh, triggered the world, one of the world's largest volumes of uh, silicic large igneous province volcanism. Uh, between about 188 and 162 million years ago. And during this period, as South America rifted from Antarctica, uh, it also resu resulted in the rifting of the, the Weddell Sea to the, to the east of the area there, and the deposition of a thick Backhart Basin sediments in, in East Palmer Land. A quiescence in subduction and related magnetism occurred in the late Jurassic, but as uh, subduction um, started again, Extensive passive margin sedimentation occurred in the west of the peninsula on Alexi Alexander Island and Adelaide Island, which is the, oops, the two islands you see on the right-hand side of the diagram there. Now, this um, magmatic quiescence uh, was followed by a peak in magmatic um, activity during the early Cretaceous, uh, associated with extensional tectonics and development of uh, volcanic arc magnetism. Now, the mid-Cretaceous uh, this, this, this is, is key to the importance of this, um, this study, as the trans, tra transpressional deformation along the peninsula triggered a peak in continental arc magnetism and the emplacement of the Lastic Coast Intrusive Suite, um, including the plutonic activity in, in the study area shown there in red, which is dominantly tonalitic in composition, but ranging from py pyroxenes to granite. Active mid-Cretaceous subduction also resulted in a thick forox uh, sedimentation on the Alexander Island, um, again, west of the peninsula. So following this mid-Cretaceous compressional uh, deformation, mag mag magmatic activity on the peninsula began to wane. Post-inversion extension uh, produced a rift of the Georgia 6 Sound, separating um, Alexander Island from the rest of the peninsula. Subduction progressively ceased northwards, uh, as did associated magnetism, and between 34 and 30 million years ago, a deep water connection was established, separating Antarctica from, from South America. And finally, following the, the cessation of subduction along the peninsula, interplate uh, alkaline volcanism has continued from about 6.5 uh, million years ago to 100,000 years ago. So... Um, very quickly, yeah, so this study, the, uh, so this project focuses on the, on the peak of intrusive magnetism recorded by the um, around 13,000 kilometres squared of intrusions formed along the last coast intrusive suite. The study area is dominated by, by this intrusive suite and their sedimentary host rocks. So um, you have some examples here of the, uh, the intrusive suite. So they look like in the field. And there's some of the uh, sedimentary host rocks. Now, although mineral occurrences are very sparse and um, uh, there's, there's not a huge amount recorded on this, there, there are having low, low volumes of um, sulphide uh, copper mineralization uh, have been observed, uh, largely associated with more mafic, gabroic, and diuretic intrusions. As you can see there. So that's the, the background geology. And this all fed into the various data sets that we compiled and, and fed into this uh, GIS analysis. Just to start off with, we had um, pretty good geological mapping at uh, 1 to 500,000 scale for pretty much all of the study area, which was uh, very useful and I think a, a really real key data set for this sort of thing. You also had a database of legacy samples, uh, geochemistry data, uh, mineral occurrence data, which included a lot of whole rock geochemistry analysis. And we also had digital terrain data. Now, you may not think this is a much relevance to um, mineral exploration, but one of the key bits of data that we really, really need to know for this mineral system approach is the structure. So uh, here I've used terrain data as a proxy for, um, for, for the structure, and uh, topographic lows were used as a proxy for major faults. And you can see there I, I've uh, interpreted um, the topographic lows as, uh, as three orders of faults shown there in uh, red, blue, and, and green. So those are the major data sets we had to feed into it. 
and you can kind of see four, four layers there. So a significant amount of processing and formatting is required to get this data into a state where it can be um, added to the model. But, you know, even though it's got onerous doing this, um, it's very important to do because it shows regional inconsistencies, sort of mapping sheet boundaries, sample bias effects, differences in scale, the kind of understanding of the data you need to have if you're kind of doing this, this, this large-scale modelling. Um, but this is the, the hardest part of it almost, processing it all. So these features are then given weights according to how important they are in the mineral system. So, for example, interpreted major fault to give a very high weight. Uh, an error, error of deep sedimentary basin might be given a low weight. And this is done on the principles of fuzzy logic, where um, it's not binary, uh, values aren't given a 1 or a 0. Instead, it's related to degrees of truth. So uh, ideas of probability. Uh, these data sets are then integrated by uh, additional multiplication of the values to create a final result, which you can, you can see here. And you can see here, unsurprisingly, the um, areas of highest probability of mineralisation are in blue, and that's where faults uh, intersect um, the large igneous intrusions. And you can see here what, what this effectively does is cuts down this very large area into two or three much smaller provinces, um, which, which can be then explored in more detail. So this is effectively a tool for, for narrowing down these areas. So very quickly, the next steps. This is very much a work in progress. Um, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. We need to extrapolate this out to the entire Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, we need to work out how a way of automatic, automatically generating structural data over such large areas. Um, we need to integrate geophysical data, such as the geomagnetics, which I think is available. And there's lots of other things we can do with this data, such as look at things like rheological contact, see if that affects it, um, different structural effects. There's lots of ways we can manipulate this data to make it, make it um, better and, and add value. And uh, that's it, so thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Um, time for a quick question. Probably. I mean, from my perspective, I mean, obviously we're looking at a bias towards sort of the gabbroic rocks and um, structural fabric for, for where you sort of refined um, potential, for example, copper um, deposits. What, in terms of other parameters for refining the model, what, what would you see, see as a priority to, to refine it to the next step? Almost? Well, like I said, we, I mean, um, I think... In, in integrating geophysical data, it's very important. Really, uh, refining the, st the structure. I mean, I've done it quite ad hoc. The yeah. way I have. Um, I think it'd be very interesting to see if you can better define the structure in geophysics and how you, how you can add geophysics. Uh, I think. Um, I mean, this is very much a first pass. I think refining the way the weights are added to the geology can be very important, uh, and that's very much an iterative process. Um, and also, you know, I think there's more detail that can be gained from, gained from the sort of geochemical data as well. Because there, there, there are issues, with, again, with obviously sam sample bias in, in, in polar regions is a big problem because you only have samples where you have, where you have um, alcohol, yeah. which, is, which is an issue. So it's, you know, kind of using statistical methods to try and iron out things like, things like that as well is a possibility. But one, one, one thing I didn't mention is the great thing about this, of course, is um, we've, we've done it here in the Antarctic, but equally this is top technique that, I mean, it's been used extensively by companies in geological um, surveys in continental interiors, and yeah, you know, this can be done on the sea floor or, or in Mars or, or, or wherever, really. So it's a, you know, a good, good, good thing to do with, with limited data. Good. Thanks, Tom. <laughs>